will just hit record and we can really get started to the events of the day. So really good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on the part of the globe that you're tuning in from. And really a warm welcome to the joint SDG fund COI 16 side event. My name is Vicky Aridi, the youth engagement specialist for the joint SDG fund. And I will be your host for today's session. Now, before we begin this, very exciting session, it would be prudent to have an overview of the Joint SDG Fund. So the Joint SDG Fund is an innovative instrument to really incentivize transformative policy shifts and stimulate strategic investments required to get the world back on track to achieve the SDGs. At the Joint SDG Fund, we support countries to accelerate the attainment of the 2030 agenda. Looking at what we've been able to achieve so far, we have funded 125 joint programs focused on integrated social protection and SDG financing with an upcoming portfolio on small island developing states, stimulated over 600 partnerships working together alongside the United Nations to really accelerate the SDGs and tested over 100 innovative solutions globally. Now with that background in mind, we can now shift gear to the event of today. Today's event is entitled The Green Pathway, Climate Finance for a Sustainable World. With an increase in drought, global temperatures, floods, disruptive rainfall patterns, fires engulfing nature across the globe. The climate crisis as we know it is now more pressing than ever. Now looking at some statistics from the World Bank, an additional 132 million people. I'd just like you to ponder on that. 132 million people could be pushed, could be pushed into extreme poverty by climate change alone in 2030. If this climate crisis as we know it is not addressed. So in order to resolve this pending and this raging climate crisis, there's such a pertinent need for green investments across the globe. In light of the reality today, this conversation comes at such an opportune time because we are at the tail end of the journey, the road to COP26, where negotiations and commitments on climate action will be brought to the fore. Today, as we embark on the road to COP26, we will explore through the discussion how different stakeholders through our panel and keynote address are really contributing to achieving this green and sustainable world that we seek through climate finance. Now, before we get started, just two housekeeping rules. Feel free to engage. This is a youth-led session with intergenerational conversations. So feel free to put your contributions on the chat and let us know where you're joining from. What are your thoughts on the conversation? And also feel free to keep engaging us and the conversation going on social media and tag us at Join SDG Fund. Now, with that background in mind, let's get right into it. So we'll kickstart this exciting event. I can't tell you how excited I am to be moderating this with a powerful and inspiring keynote address from none other than the Swedish State Secretary for International Development Corporation, Ms. Janine Eriksson. I will now hand over the floor and invite Ms. Janine Eriksson to take it away with her powerful keynote address. A warm welcome to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored really to be given the opportunity to provide the keynote address here at this important event. Since youth leaders and youth movements have shown the way on climate change. Last year, we all know the world was stuck by, struck by the pandemic, which rightly has been called the biggest crisis since the end of the Second World War. We have seen extreme poverty increase massively on a global scale for the first time in decades. Progress towards the Sustainable Development Goals has been set back significantly. 
but the crisis brought on by the pandemic pales in comparison to the climate crisis that we are facing. The science is abundantly clear. We are faced with a very narrow window, less than 10 years to drastically reduce global emissions and prevent irreversible damage to our planet, livelihoods, and ultimately our lives. A holistic approach is needed to cope with the climate crisis, that we need a new green economic model. But for this transition to happen, we need far-reaching national commitments based on sound and sustainable policy, finance and technology. All countries need to systematically integrate climate change into the national budgets and make climate action a top priority. We need a rapid and ambitious phasing out of fossil fuels and coal, including subsidies. Sweden started this work over 30 years ago. The science was clear already back then, and we have always recognized our responsibility as a high income country to act and act decisively. Sweden is at the forefront of an inclusive and technology-driven green transition that creates jobs for the future. We call this fossil-free Sweden. And together with India, we launched the Leadership Group for Industry Transition, LEADIT, in 2019. Sweden is one of the largest per capita contributors of climate finance globally. But we need to do more. And the lessons we will eventually draw from the COVID pandemic are many. But I think it's fair to say that the pandemic has clearly demonstrated the need for more international cooperation, not less. And for this, we need a strong and effective UN system that can better deliver on the SDGs and help all countries build back better and greener. The Joint SDG Fund is an piece and our pledges on climate finance. We are seeing the contribution it makes to unlock additional resources for climate action in countries around the globe. But it is also a key instrument for turning the ambitions of a more effective and efficient UN on the ground into reality. And this is why Sweden is and will continue to be a major donor to the Joint SDG Fund. And I'm happy to announce that we will soon decide on additional contributions for 2022. Now we are only days away from COP26 in Glasgow, and one thing is clear. We all need to do more to ensure that we honor the Paris Agreement. Climate finance has a key role to unlock investments into renewable energy and to demonstrate our shared responsibility and commitment. The recently announced delivery plan stipulates that our joint 100 billion US dollars tar target will only be reached by 2023. This will not do. All rich countries need to do their part and raise their resources to deliver on this target. This goes for both public and private finance, where private finance is of utmost importance to reach the investment volumes needed. Sweden calls on all stakeholders to deliver on their 100 billion climate finance commitments to pave the way for increased global ambition. And Sweden stands ready to do its part. We recently announced our intention to double our climate financing by 2025. We have a joint responsibility who need to be at the center of the green transition. Youth leaders and youth movements across the globe have done so much to put the spotlights on the need for more action to meet. I sure hope you will continue to challenge us and to ensure that we stay true to our words on climate action and climate finance, because it's only together that we can tackle this crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Janine. You have spoken to the heart of really the event today, really calling for multi-stakeholders to stay true to their commitments, especially the $100 billion commitment for climate finance, and really for a stronger UN system to work together to advance climate action. And really now going back to governments and seeing how can we integrate matters to do with SDG financing, climate finance into a national systems, national policies, and really 
what can we do to ensure fossil free countries? So thank you so much for that powerful keynote address. You have left us with so much to ponder on. We are now going to our intergenerational panel discussion, and we have a diverse group of experts who will discuss and share with us different insights on how climate finance in particular is indeed the green pathway to attain a sustainable and greener world. Without further ado, let me introduce to you our wonderful panel. We have Ms. Rosanna Dudziak, the UN resident coordinator in North Macedonia, Mr. Vladislav Kain, the UN Secretary General's Youth Climate Advisory Group member, Mr. Borja Rojo, a Clean Energy Strategy Advisor at World Food Program, and Ms. Amanda Costa, Forbes 30 Under 30 Climate Activist and G20 Brazil Youth Climate Representative. A warm welcome to you all, and we're so thrilled to have you today. Now, we'll really kickstart this panel and would like to start with Ms. Rosanna. And to you, Ms. Rosanna, as the UN Resident Coordinator of North Macedonia, could you highlight to us what is North Macedonia doing for climate action? Good morning, good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be here today in this panel. I think it's really essential to involve young people in national decision-making processes, especially in the field of climate because of course no one is more affected than your generation. The young people of North Macedonia are about a fifth of the population and young people are expecting to be engaged. The UN in North Macedonia designed several consultation processes to make sure that young people are heard. And here are some concrete examples on how the younger generations are engaged in this country. The first is a youth consultation process by UNICEF and President Penderovsky's office called Reimagine the Future. And this initiative confirmed that climate change and environment are among the most important issues. Through several workshops and activities, climate change and the environment, in addition to education and quality of life, turned out to be the most important issues for young people in the country. The second is the U Report, which is a UNICEF-led global messaging tool for adolescents, youth, and community to participate in any issue that affects them. The U Report was used to gather the views of young people on environment and climate change. 288 young people were polled via Viber and half of them are not aware of the climate targets of the country. So somehow the information channel is not reaching young people about important climate information. But 70% of youth think that they can and should influence environmental policies at the local level. And the UN together with partners is trying to create this space. The results of this consultation is the Youth Climate Declaration, which was adopted at the Youth Climate Summit in Skopje on Thursday last week, which as you know is a call to action from young people to create the space for them to engage in climate action. The government also paid special attention to youth consultations during the preparation of the revised nationally determined contributions, the NDCs, to the Paris Agreement with support from UNDP, a consultation process for youth involvement in climate change had about 300 young Macedonians. This amplified the voices of those most affected by climate change to empower young people to take action. It's also important to highlight that North Macedonia has committed to the most ambitious target on reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the Western Balkans, which is a 51% reduction planned by 2030. I'm happy to highlight that beyond these ambitious commitments, some tangible activities have happened. In 2020 alone, energy generation from renewable resources in North Macedonia increased by 10% from 2019. And in 2021, several sizable new investments in renewable energy production have started, including three new wind parks and a new solar power plant. Also one of the biggest photovoltaic facilities in Europe is planned to be built in the country, estimated at around 200 million euros. Transition away from coal is scheduled to start in 2025 and major capital investment in renewable energy and energy efficiency are unavoidable and urgent. But obviously this comes with certain costs. It's estimated that it will take 20 billion euros through 2030, and the government contributions are only about 4% of the total. And 54% of the money is expected to come from mixed financing, 
from government, donors, private sector, and consumers. But mobilizing funding and beyond mobilizing funding and working on incentives to stimulate greater SDGs, we also need to work on new financial instruments. And this is one of the important tools of the United Nations in that direction is the Joint SDG Fund. This global fund, which is co-financed by member states, supports developing countries as they accelerate their progress towards the SDG and enables combined UN expertise. The fund aims to mobilize 290 million US dollars a year and provides these funds to projects competitively throughout the world. One of the projects that has reached the final round is a project from North Macedonia, which is called the Green Financing Facility. This will be a new financial instrument that will provide access to affordable green financing for small and medium enterprises and underserved households to enable them to invest in renewable energy and energy efficiency solutions, such as photovoltaics and solar panels. We hope that there will be available, therefore, favorable loans for renewable energies for these households and small and medium enterprises. This will contribute directly to SDG 7 on affordable and clean energy, as well as SDG 13, which will significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. To conclude, we must put youth at the center of decision-making processes on climate change. The time to take action and work together to preserve our planet's ecosystem and reduce our carbon footprint is now. Efforts to secure significant financing needed to transition to cleaner energy are an important part of climate action. It's my generation's duty to create space for young people to be heard and to support youth-led climate action. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Rosanna. That was quite, quite comprehensive. And just looking at how in North Macedonia, young people are really being heard when it comes to climate change through the Youth Climate Declaration, through the U report, and through the Reimagine the Future. And then seeing North Macedonia as a country really committing to transition from coal and to really be keen on saying we as a country really need to see how we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Then narrowing down to how critical the fund is was quite, quite insightful. And you talked a bit about the joint program and you really brought to light how in North Macedonia through the joint program, you'll be able to set up a green financing facility. And really that facility will be very critical in enabling households and different stakeholders to really shift to renewable energy. So thank you for that insight. So on to our next speaker, really Vladislav, we're thrilled to have you on board. And you are a member of the inaugural UN Secretary General's Youth Climate Advisory Group. The Secretary General this year at the UN General Assembly presented the Our Common Agenda report. And this report is so critical because it looks ahead to the next 25 years and represents the Secretary General's vision on what the future holds for global cooperation and strengthening inclusive and networked and effective multilateralism. So Vlad, could you share with us what are some of the key priorities of our common agenda when it comes to youth and climate? Thank you very much for this question, Vicky. Uh, in the context of uh, the nexus between uh, youth engagement and climate finance, when it comes to the UN Secretary General's climate strategy that uh, we are overseeing in our mandate in the Youth Advisory Group, but also looking through the lens of our common agenda, we find one common theme that uh, straddles uh, throughout both of the documents, and that is the priority of working together in order to overcome shared challenges, of which climate change is, of course, the primary one. Uh, the multilateral system, uh, as it is right now, uh, has delivered a lot in order to uh, mobilize meaningful climate action, but at the same time, we see huge gaps remaining, uh, which were outlined by the rollout of the new climate finance delivery plan before COP, by the production gap report uh, that was uh, released by the UNEP. And we see that in order to galvanize the resources that are required, not just financial, technological, but also human, because ultimately without people, 
and for people and by people, any efforts related to climate action or any other shared challenges will unfortunately fail, regardless of how much we will finance them. And the Secretary General's agenda and the report that he presented to the General Assembly, they aim to demonstrate to us that through innovations at the level of youth representation as well within the multilateral system, we are able to provide a breakthrough in terms of what ideas and contributions in such an important aspect as climate action in general and climate finance in particular, youth can actually bring to the table. Uh, with this in mind, it is unfortunately important to see, it is, it is, it is quite important also to see how we will operationalize the gains that are potentially there to be from implementation of our common agenda. And here, whereas the youth advisory group uh, jumps in and uh, makes sure that uh, together with all the youth colleagues from the youth climate movement, we are able to provide those insights within the UN system, as well as to open the gateways for as many youth on the ground who are engaging in climate action that are able to provide their inputs and to ensure that the topics of climate finance, which I'm responsible for in my mandate is youth advisory group, uh, will receive their true and due recognition. Thank you so much, Vlad, for that, because you have said that at the heart of the com our common agenda is how can we overcome shared challenges? And really, one of the greatest resources is people. So how can we galvanize these resources, including people, to achieve climate action and to really address this issue of climate change? And really that when we look at our common agenda, youth innovation is very, very key moving forward. So thank you for sharing that with us. And now, Borja, we are so glad you could be here with us today. And World Food Program have done so much work when it comes to achieving zero hunger globally. And this work can really be strengthened by ensuring that the beneficiaries you work with have access to energy to be able to produce transform and consume the food, which is really, really critical in matters of food security and nutrition. So over to you, Borja. What are some of the key energy for food security initiatives that World Food Program has championed? Thanks, Vicky. Um, first of all, I'm very happy to be here at this inspiring uh, event and in this interesting panel. So, so thank you for the, the invitation. Um, let me start by giving some uh, brief uh, context. Uh, World Food Program is the largest uh, humanitarian organization in the world uh, delivering food uh, to the people in need. In fact, in 2020, more than 100 million people were served uh, in 84 countries, which is a, a big achievement. So why is energy important for, for us, for World Food Program? Well, uh, let me say in a very simple way, right up front, uh, when food is delivered, uh, which is a core activity of what the World Food Program does, it needs to be cooked. Uh, I'm not going to enter in why the food needs to be cooked, right? But uh, it's a very important need. Uh, this energy need is sometimes not taken care of well enough, uh, at least in some emergencies. At my team, uh, called Energy for Food Security, we go further because we believe that energy is an enabler of transformative socioeconomic opportunities that touches on every aspect of life and, of course, of sustainable development and many of the, of the SDGs, actually. Uh, and the ability to access energy is fundamental to achieving food security and, and zero hunger, the goal of my organization. In other words, energy is a key element that contributes to the World Food Program motto, saving lives and changing lives. And uh, so we are partnering to implement uh, market-based sustainable energy approaches to providing food assistance and also enabling resilience activities that create and improve local value chains. Regarding energy, we are trying to change from a model of delivery and distribution to a model where a closer collaboration with the private sector and governments enables a longer term solution via building energy markets for vulnerable communities. In, more sim in simpler words, we are enabling uh, solar irrigation systems, for example, 
food, transform food transformation equipment, like solar powered uh, electric milling machines. Preservation solutions like refrigerators to keep the nutritional value of the food and avoid food waste. Let me actually say that up to 40% of the food is sometimes wasted in some uh, parts of uh, Africa and some other parts of, of the world because of the lack of preservation solutions. And actually this waste uh, represents up to 8% of the greenhouse gas emi emissions globally. So it, this is a big deal. And uh, above all, one very important thing that we do is a modern cooking solution. We try to provide a modern cooking solution to still 4 billion people that still cook, cook uh, traditionally with firewood or sharp coal as fuels, risking their health and nutrition, wasting time, incurring in uh, protection issues when gathering firewood, uh, negatively impacting their money, their pockets, and uh, emitting a lot of CO2 too. So we are glad to be able to facilitate access to energy for food security, um, but we want to do more because there are so many people that need clean energy for, for the lives. Thank you so much, Borja, for that. And you have just spoken to the nexus between energy and food security. And really, WFP is really moving this forward with the solar irrigation systems, with the milling systems that are put in place, and also preservation. And also just ensuring that whatever food security initiatives are done by WFP, there is a component of saying, how can we ensure that energy is a component of these programs. Thank you so much. Now, Amanda, over to you. Um, you are a climate activist in Brazil. And this year with the Amazon, raging fires have just continued to engulf nature. And you have been very outspoken about climate. As a youth climate activist, what are some of these activities that you have led to really contribute to addressing climate change in Brazil? Um, thank you, Vicky. First of all, I want to thank you all for this amazing event. Talk about climate finance, climate issues are very important to we change the direction of the world. We need to engage every single person to start to be part of the solution and start to look to climate crisis and think how can we deal with this situation. And I'd like to share what we are done with Perifa Sintável, my organization, to democratize and to amplify the climate um, talk, the climate um, debate, to favelas and islands in Brazil. Here, guys, um, I am in Glasgow. I'm at Glasgow with a youth delegation of four Black women. We are with Vitoria Pinheiro, a uh, Afro-Indigenous trans who lives in the Amazon. We are with Ellen Monielli, he's in the northwest part of Brazil. And I and Mahayan Sampaio, we are in Sao Paulo. But nothing about this will happen if we didn't have funds to pay this, this trip. We got partnerships with some um companies and some NGOs that are helping us to be here and to show to the world what is happening in Brazil. Unfortunately, we have Jair Bolsonaro as our president. And this president, he is a negationist. He doesn't believe in climate crisis. So it's very important to engage the youth, engage civil society, and engage the companies to start to look to this issue and start to think of solutions that will bring more people, will bring more groups, will bring more different um, articulations to look to this issue. So what have been done with Perifa Sustentável? We work in all regions. We are in the Amazon, we are in Sao Paulo, Islam, and we are democratizing this talk because think with me, for young people who live in the soft part of the world, climate crisis, it's very hard discussion. We have a lot of English terms. And in Brazil, just 5% of all population can speak English. Instead of this, we have a lot of technical terms. So we, we don't talk 
the um, the language of the population, the language of the slums, the language of the groups, we will just maintain a white, privileged people talking about climate. And to change all of these stuff, we need to, first of all, we need to put money, we need to invest in young people who are in the grassroots, who are in the contact with people who live in the Amazon. Because our government in Brazil is not helping us. But I stopped just to look to the government and start to complain. And I decide to be part of the solution. And I know each person who are in this meeting want to be part of the solution, want to engage uh, communities, groups, youth, to start to look to these questions. Because here in COP26, the negotiators, they are talking about our present and our future. And if we don't participate, they will decide our lives without us. So I'm here and I want to stand up as a United Nations Youth Ambassador, as a Forbes under 30 leader, but also as a leader of my favela, leader of my community. And to understand that the traditional kind of movement that we have in my territory, in my region, is so important compared to the negotiators' kind of movement, compared to the university kind of movement. And I know that everyone who is in this meeting can be part of the solution, can start to engage communities, and can change the world. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. As you've put it, be part of the solution. It's time to have conversations about the present and the future. Invest in grassroots organizations and working with them and partner with diverse stakeholders. So over to you now, Ms. Rosanna, and you highlighted this in your opening remarks, but could you now delve a bit deeper and share with us, how will the joint program really now that you had mentioned in your opening remarks, contributes to enhanced green finance and attainment of SDG 7 on clean and renewable energy? Thank you. Already the partnerships that have been built, get raising the awareness, we have six out of the eight national banks that have committed to be a part of this, uh, which previously there was not an incentive really for uh, private banks to be a part of this solution. We also have increased awareness of why these resources are needed. And I, honestly, this is also part of creating demand for better greener energy solutions. So already I think the increased awareness in the private sector banks are some of our key partners, the, the financing institutions, the international financing institutions. Uh, we already have the commitment of the government, but I think there's already some tangible increased awareness. And hopefully when we get into the phase of, of implementation, we will actually have a lot of more households uh, actively investing in these solutions. Thank you so much. You have really highlighted that banks are a key component of the program and really seeing how the program can enhance commitments really for green finance and scaling up also at the household level. So over to you, Vlad. The advisory group that you are part of has been very critical in ensuring youth views and realities are represented in the implementation of the Secretary General's climate strategy. What role have you played in implementing and advancing this climate strategy? Thank you for this question, especially considering how important in terms of surge and change in quality youth climate activism in general has been starting from the period right before the pandemic in the, on the verge of the Young Youth Climate Summit and coming all the way after. Uh, the youth input that makes a significant impact within the framework of the Secretary General's climate strategy was absolutely important. Hence, our mission was primarily to be those who put foot in the door 
and then smash it out in order to make sure that other colleagues who are enjoy who are enjoying even less of a privilege to be uh, able to advise to the UN Secretary General as we do to make their voices heard and go straight to the source because consistently the Secretary General has shown himself as a great champion of youth when it comes to advocating on their behalf as well uh, for robust climate action. He is uh, oftentimes just as disappointed in the inaction of many world leaders as we are. He understands the, uh, the same way as we do and the challenges that youth are still facing within uh, the international multilateral system and the youth part of the, our common agenda is an emanation of that. So we in the youth advisory group, we are, as I said, uh, moving uh, part the needle on making sure that there is uh, as little gatekeeping as possible in order to provide youth input uh, into the strategy but in general into the process and into the way UN, UN agencies in general think and conceptualize youth engagement and youth expertise when it comes to uh, issues related to climate change, including climate finance. There is still unfortunately a wrong perception that precise technical components of the climate agenda are somehow not of interest to the youth. And uh, our mission, together with the colleagues who are doing their job and other jobs in other positions, not just in the youth advisory group, is to show how blatantly untrue it is and how much potential there is there to tap in terms of expertise that is already there. What is needed is only the institutional and political will on behalf of the UN system and the parties to recognize it. Thank you, Vlad. And really, as you put it, the technical parts of the climate strategy or different climate documents, which often young people are seen not to be experts, that they can truly be experts and that their voices really matter in advancing the different strategies. Just now a follow up to that on the technical beat. So in 2009, many governments around the world and Ms. Janine Erickson in her keynote address really spoke about the $100 billion promise on climate finance. And ahead of COP26, there have been calls across the globe for multi-stakeholders to deliver on the $100 billion climate finance commitment. So in your opinion, what reforms need to take place for this commitment to be delivered by states? Was that a question to me? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> uh, that is, of course, I think uh, a very the, the easy but also very difficult answer to that question is, of course, uh, it takes political will. Uh, the leaders has to uh, have to uh, prioritize it. They have to count it into the budgets and and really put commitments uh, behind the words. Uh, and that is, as we have seen, many are talking very much about the climate and the importance uh, of doing everything we can. But when it comes to these issues and raising funds and doing really walk the walk and not just talk, uh, we have seen that there is, uh, uh, it's much more difficult. Uh, but there is nothing else to do than to keep on uh, talking about it, pushing for it, lift that goal and the importance of it uh, because it's also that is really something that shows that we are committed to do this together because we cannot do it one and one nation at the time uh, not one and one generation at the time we have to see it be done and this is a really important tool Thank you so much, Ms. Janine, for that. And really, as you put it, political will is critical and partnerships. We can't deliver on our commitments alone. Now, over to you, Borja. As you've been sharing about access to clean and renewable energy, really, this is such a pertinent concern. And in order to have interventions for clean energy, blended finance is critical. So could you share with us what is blended finance? 
Good question, uh, Vicky. Well, uh, put simply, uh, blended finance is uh, indeed the next uh, horizon for energy interventions in humanitarian and development sector that I represented today. Uh, grants have been the traditional source of funding for energy projects, and in general, the grants uh, has been the only financing available for them. And because of that, uh, grants uh, used to the to the fund of the implementation of an energy project uh, completely uh, results that energy projects are only sustainable for as long as the grant funding lasts. So this is an issue, a challenge that we have. So in order to deliver energy projects that are sustainable beyond the life of the grant, uh, new delivery models are required. And this is the core of the methodology of work at my team in Gold Fruit Program and at many of our partners too, the energy delivery model or EDM as we call it. So the private sector is increasingly seeking commercial opportunities to deliver energy access, namely cooking and electricity to end users. Many of the vulnerable communities that we support are in real need of energy solutions. But given the lack of money and sometimes the high risk associated, the private sector is cautious in its approach to delivering energy services. So blended finance then provides an opportunity to bridge the short-term nature of grant funding while providing seed funding to mobilize uh, private capital to support commercial entities when entering in emerging or frontier markets to deliver sustainable long-term energy solutions. So blended finance is a solution both for the lack of funding and for the risk associated to, to the energy projects. So for this reason, uh, blended finance is a topic that uh, NORCAP, the Norwegian uh, global provider of expertise that I also belong, is uh, recently focused, uh, focusing on it, putting a lot of work in, 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 on it, uh, using the, utilizing the large network of energy experts uh, around the world. So it is a growing topic. It is uh, the, the next horizon. But, uh, but more intense participation of different stakeholders are still needed. Thank you so much, Borja, for just letting us know what really blended finance is. And usually in the pursuit of finance for clean energy projects from donors and international organizations, challenges often arise. Could you maybe, Borja, share with us what are some of these key challenges in the pursuit for blended finance? Sure. Uh, I think this is a very pertinent question. Um, well, I will, I will start saying that uh, the, probably the most important challenge posed by the uh, rigidity of the annual budget cycles of funding. Uh, this makes almost impossible for the humanitarian sector, for example, to implement energy projects. Uh, why? Because some of these uh, projects can take, take up to build uh, five years from the initial stage uh, of planning to completion. So there is a challenge with the timing of the, the, the cycles, the, the matching of the cycles and the, and the needs of the energy projects. And then we have another challenge. Uh, so related to this, when traditional donors uh, provide grants to humanitarian organizations, they are seeking results uh, with, a direct, with a direct humanitarian impact. And as such, often energy projects are viewed uh, as, as uh, development initiatives. So because the projects and the result also stretch over a longer time. So there is a mismatch again in, in what the energy project needs uh, funding and the expectations of the humanitarian uh, donors. And lastly, I will, uh, I will also share that this is a very common perception in the sector. We would like to see easier access to, to funding for clean energy projects from organizations like Green Climate Fund or the World Bank. It is improving, no doubt. Uh, but we would like to see more facility to, to implement projects. First, uh, helping the people in need of clean energy for their everyday life. And second, to reduce the huge uh, bulk of uh, greenhouse uh, gases emissions that these activities uh, provoke. Because uh, no doubt, delivering clean energy to the people in need is also part of uh, climate change mitigation that we all urgently need. Thank you so much. You have pointed to some of the key challenges, such as the matching cycles, and also often there's 
the need for those projects that have a direct humanitarian impact, which is often a different approach when it comes to some of these energy projects where it's more on the development side of things. So thank you so much for that. Now over to you, Amanda. So climate finance is such a concern for youth activists like yourself, and more so when it comes to financing for these youth-led climate initiatives. So in your opinion, what needs to be done to enhance financing for youth-led climate initiatives? The first thing, uh, youth need to be seen a very important agents that can lead the transformation. Because for a long time, People look to the youth like, oh, they are so inspired. They will change the world. But we need resource to change the world. We need connections to change the world. We need to put in a place that our voice will be heard, but at the same time, the money will be on our hands. Because if you want to construct another world, if you want to construct an uh, inclusive, diverse, and sustainable world, we need to start to look to the youth as a very powerful agent. And when I start to make this speech, when I hold this boldness, I am looking to the old generations that came before me. And I'm very humble to say that the youth generation cannot do all the work. The youth is not the future. And if you want to have a different posture, if you want to have a different behavior, we need to start to build partnership with the most experienced generations. So I want to ask to everyone who are who is in this in this meeting, how can we build intergenerational partnerships that they youth will be seen as a very powerful agent, but the most experienced people will get on youth hands and will show some ways, you'll give some resource because the speech is very beautiful. This kind of meetings is awesome. I love to be in this kind of conversations, but at the same time, I want to get my hands dirty and I want to construct together, but the resources will not in my hands yet. But maybe after this conversation, they will. So the first step I think is we need to move the conversations, the debates, the talks, and we start to construct together and making partnerships between youth and most experienced generations. Thank you, Amanda. You've called for intergenerational partnerships, the need for youth to have access to these resources and also to have and be part of the construction of the inclusive world and the sustainable future that we seek. Now, Amanda, a follow-up question to you. You are in Glasgow right now. So you are right at the road to COP26. And on this road, youth activists across the globe have been campaigning and shedding light on the need for world leaders to deliver on their commitments, the need for inclusive participation from the global south. So to you as a climate activist, what would you tell other youth activists like yourself on how they can mobilize resources, amplify their voices, and be heard to address climate change? Vicky, this question is awesome. It's the question of my life. And I know that here in this meeting, we have a lot of young people that want to do something, but they don't know how to give the first step. They don't know how to start. They don't know how to mobilize their community. So the first advice that I would like to, to give to you, we need to start to communicate. A lot of time we stop because we don't have all the kind of men. We don't have all the experience. And we don't know that our actions or our speech is right. But we don't need to look about what other people will think. We just need to give the first step. So start to communicate. Get your cell phone, 
start to make social media and start to tell what is burning your heart because I'm pretty sure if you're right here in this meeting, it's because you want to be part of discussions like this. But I don't want you to just be part, to just listen, to just watch us. I want you, after the meeting, to get your cell phone and start to explain about what you heard here. Explain about the importance of youth to be part of climate agenda. Because maybe I cannot achieve a person um, that lives in South Africa, but maybe someone here in this meeting can. And when we start to involve ourselves in this agenda, we can transform a reality because this is the first step. So this is the first thing that we need to do to start. And first, we communicate. Second, we act. It's very hard to act alone, act by ourselves. But when we are in a group, when we have a delegation, when we are with other people, if you, we get hurt, other people, we get our hands and will do with us. So the first step, communicate. The second step, be with people, articulate in groups. And the third step, is start to understand how your politics works. So I know how Brazilian politics works. And now I start to talk about Brazilian politicians. I start to write projects, write actions, and help them to achieve my community. And I know that people here, they want to do this, but sometimes they don't know how. You don't need to move to the third step, the politics first. So start getting your cell phone and communicate this issue. Second, be with groups, be with people who are looking to the same goal that you are. And the third step, start to involve with politics because Politics will transform the world. Here, I am a young person, a single black girl. But when I am uh, with the decision makers, I can influence a nation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda. As Amanda has rightly put, what will you do after this event? Communicate, take action, and increase your sphere of influence and your circle of influence. Now, we're moving to the next stage after this intergenerational panel discussion that had so many insights to the call to action. So we are going to invite each panelist to just share with us in one brief sentence on how will they contribute to build a sustainable world through climate action? And we'd like to start with you, Rosanna. How will you contribute to build a sustainable world through climate action in one sentence? I think you need to go in reverse order. No, I, <laughs> how am I contributing to climate action? I think one of our big roles is definitely in awareness raising. So, for, so that we have a multiplier effect. Uh, and I personally am very committed and I have a hybrid vehicle. So that's my personal commitment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosanna. Awareness raising hybrid vehicle. Now over to you, Vlad. How will you contribute to build a sustainable world through climate action? One sentence. I will contribute through continuing to do my work of mainstreaming youth expertise in climate action, because without youth expertise, there will be no climate action. Thank you so much, Vlad. Mainstreaming youth expertise. Now over to you, Borja. One sentence again. How will you contribute to build a sustainable world through climate action? Well, I will say that uh, all my professional career has been in, uh, in climate action, uh, mainly working on uh, you know, implementing solar solar power projects around the world. So, and I plan to continue doing so. So that's my commitment. Thank you so much, Borja. Continuing to ensure energy for food security through solar power. And to you, Amanda, in just one sentence, how will you contribute to build a sustainable world through climate action? I have a sentence that I keep in my heart and says, you can't be an ambientalist without being anti-racist. 
So if you want to fight against climate crisis, we need to put black people, indigenous people in the center of climate debates. Thank you so much, Amanda, for really saying and contributing to building a sustainable world through inclusivity and ensuring that no one is left behind as you embark on advancing climate action. So we're now winding down our event, and we couldn't have wound down this event without a special closing remark from Mr. Vladislav Kaim the UN Secretary General's Climate Youth Advisory Group member. So over to you to share some closing remarks to put everything together. Over to you. Thank you very much, Vicky. I think we have realized uh, both in our discussion, but also in the reality that we are facing on the ground in our work, that as just as SDG Fund is joined, successful work for climate action is also to be joined. And that is a work that straddles across generations, domains of knowledge, actors who are able to contribute regardless of their status. And our discussion really helps to contribute paradigmatically to how we can actually align our forces coming further in the decade of action for the SDGs, but particularly in the new cycle in uh, climate agenda that will open after COP26. But also, it is extremely important that we use those insights and leverage that expertise already here and now, both at the local level, but also extremely important at COP26 right here and now. Because the value of intergenerational allyship is going to be tested there. It's going to be tested here in Glasgow, and this is going to be the ultimate test of commitment to meaningful intergenerational collaborations on behalf of both a, a representatives of both age categories. Let's seize this opportunity because it might as well be that for our generation, there will be no one more after COP26. And it is extremely important that we embrace this common effort with everything we have with great focus and also sense of the future in the long term as well. Because even though youth are often called youth the future and then are dismissed, what is actually our ability to bring to the table together with the seniors is precisely the ability to take decisions now with great care for the future. And I encourage every one of us to bring this spirit to our work environments, to our communities, to our partners, in order to make it tangible, practical, and with results that deliver both for the generation senior and junior and for the planet as well. Thank you so much, Vlad. That was a powerful, powerful closing remark. And just to pick on one statement, Vlad said, seize the moment. So as you take action for climate, seize that moment. Be that agent of transformative change. You've heard it today from our experts that wherever you are, whatever space you are in, you can take action for climate. You can be at the forefront of ensuring that this green pathway, climate finance, can be present to achieve the green and sustainable world that we all want to live in, that we all want to see. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you for the engagement on the chat. And for those who have also been engaging on social media, thank you so much. We also have a donate to the SDGs button that will be shared in the chat that you can see more on how can you pledge to advance the SDGs, including climate action. But thank you once again for joining us. I have been your host, Vicky Aridi. Thank you, amazing panelists. Your insights were so rich. Thank you, Ms. Janine Erickson for your powerful keynote address. And thank you to everyone who joined us. That's it for now. Have a great evening, great start of your day, and a great weekend ahead. Goodbye for now. Bye bye. And thank you, Vicky. Thank bye. you. Bye. Thank you for leading this discussion.